Hello and welcome to the first of several short lectures on topic 6, fracture and fatigue. Or another way to think about this topic is how things break and what we can do to prevent them, prevent them from breaking in the future. So let's get started. The outline for topic 6 basically follows the big picture. Remember that the big picture has four key components. Composition, or what a material is made out of processing or how we turn a raw material into a desired shape and those two things together combine to give us the structure of a material or what it, what the interior of that material looks like if we can see inside of it and finally that structure determines for us the performance of the material what its properties will be well throughout this topic we're going to be looking at two key components from one is fracture mechanisms which is how things break which is dependent on how we make them and also their structure. And then in terms of performance, we'll look at a new property called toughness. Toughness is the ability of a material to resist damage and is similar to strength but not quite the same concept. So why do we study the failure of materials in the first place? Well, if we properly design structures, we want them to avoid excessive loads, either elastic or plastic, that could cause damage. Fractures, which are catastrophic in nature, are extremely dangerous for a number of reasons. Most important, human lives are at risk. In addition to that, if a product breaks and has to be recalled, there are financial losses for the company at hand and we also run the risk of equipment and our products becoming unavailable from manufacturing facilities. So the picture here shows a ship known as the Liberty Ship. Let me switch to a different pen. This is the Liberty Ship and you can see that the hull of the ship fractured cleanly right there during service. This is from a, a figure from about 1940s the Liberty ships were built during World War II to carry supplies from North America to Russia to help the Russians and the British fight the war against the Germans. The ships were made quickly and with cheaper steel and as a consequence became embrittled and failed and fractured while sailing across the North Sea. Many sailors lost their lives as a result of these ships sinking. So what are some possible causes of fracture? Well, The causes are things you may not have considered. For example, improper design, if we don't design to support the loads, we risk the possibility of fracture. But also improper processing, how we ma manufacture the material, improper material selection, not choosing the right material for the right application, and misuse of product. In other words, users not using the product for what it was intended for can cause it to fracture. It turns out the engineer's job is to anticipate all of these possible causes of failure and to design to avoid them. So that includes misuse of the product, which can be difficult to predict in advance. So let's take a look at an application where fracture is a serious problem. The application we'll be focusing on in this topic is pressure vessels. So pressure vessels include a whole range of things, including aerosol spray cans for spray paint, propane gas tanks for your grill, the cabins of aircraft, aircraft and also nuclear reactors have high pressure storage containers. Pressure vessels have a history of failing. These are pictures, this one dating from the 1930s, where a large steam pressure vessel fractured along this line, as you can see here, killing several of the workers in the plant at the time. This is a picture from a propane gas tank attached to a truck. You can see the front end of the truck here and the propane tank back here and the large rupture leading to flames erupting here. A classic example of a pressure vessel failure is the Boeing 737 Aloha Airlines failure of 1987. In this case the airplane was flying at cruising altitudes of close to 30,000 feet when the skin of the aircraft, which is made of very thin aluminum, peeled away from the front of the cockpit area, the front of the cabin. 
One stewardess lost her life, but the remainder of the passengers were buckled into their seats and survived. The plane was eventually able to land, and the remaining passengers were taken off the plane safely. This failure occurred because of a crack which developed in the aluminum skin and grew whoops, and grew as we added each cycle of pressurizing and depressurizing the cabin during flight. So how do pressure vessels get loaded? Well, if we imagine a cylindrical pressure vessel, which is a good approximation for many types of pressure vessels, there are two dominant loading modes, or stress directions. There are hoop stresses which wrap around the pressure vessel, around the circumferential direction, and there are longitudinal stresses which act along the length of the cylinder. So as we see here, we have hoop stresses going in the vertical direction, and longitudinal stresses going in the, the longitudinal direction, or, or horizontal direction. Another way to look at this is if I cut through the cylinder walls, I have hoop stresses acting through the material, the material wall in this direction, and longitudinal stresses acting along the length of the tube. Well, it turns out that hoop stresses are twice as high as longitudinal stresses, typically. So if I have a simple cylindrical pressure vessel like this stainless steel superheater tube and shown in the picture, the stresses acting around the hoop or the circumference are twice as high as they are in the longitudinal direction. So if the pipe is going to fail, it's probably going to fail by that those hoop stresses going in this direction. That means that if there's a crack, that crack will tend to propagate this way and this way because cracks always propagate 90 degrees to the maximum stress. So whatever material we choose to be a pressure vessel, it has to be able to withstand the movement of a crack within it.